gosh, I'm backstage tweeting. I'm just, uh, oh, it's so much going on. Hi, everybody. Um, um, well, I, I'm a tweeter. And I've uh, begun, begun to understand the power of uh, social media. And I have an amazing group of friends that we're going to talk with about it. First of all, Ramsey Adams is the executive director of Water Defense, partner with Mark Ruffalo, uh, the founder and the executive uh, director of Catskill Mountain Keeper, and, uh, th which is an environmental nonprofit based uh, group in upstate New York, right? Okay. Molly Swenson is the COO and founder of Riot, that covered a lot at Standing Rock. Uh, it's an LA-based media company, and it was just acquired by HuffPost. Uh, she was named uh, under, to the Forbes 30 Under 30 2017 list in media, and in 2016 was named one of the Ad Week's Young Influentials. And <laughs> John Quigley, award-winning artist, producer, activist, board member at Emma, and through your company, Spectral Q, John has created more than 200 aerial art images involving 200,000 people on seven continents. And I just have to say that I was very honored to be able to uh, be part of John's aerial art at Standing Rock, the Water is Life aerial thing that we'll see and talk about later on. Uh, it was an amazing experience, so let's get to work. Is this it? Yeah, here we go. You know what I just, uh, I, I spent a lot of time on the internet too reading. I don't read books anymore, but I read a lot of articles. Um, I just found out that uh, young people especially uh, are using social media and the internet more than they are watching television. 51% uh, actually uh, in the, um, Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. So we're here to talk about uh, social media, and I wanted to know what you all think about uh, the impact of social media. Um, how does it impact a person in terms of um, um, activism, you know, online petitions, do they really work? Uh, and how does that translate into actually making an impact uh, socially and then politically in terms of, uh, you know, um, policy. Yeah. I'll go. I'll go. I, I'll, I'll, I'll use two examples of the positive. Um, one is the power of one, one person. It's a story I became aware of a friend and colleague of mine, Nadine Weil, who's in the audience tonight, who would usually be in this room as an investor and, and a philanthropist. But in this particular story, she became a frontline activist. She was hiking through the Presidio um, on a, one of her favorite paths and saw a little sign that said, all of these trees are going to be clear cut uh, in like a week or two weeks, so some short period of time. And she didn't understand why they would be doing this, this beautiful forest. And once she figured out what was happening, she mobilized an online petition, and in four and a half days, she saved a thousand tree forest in the Presidio. One person who felt passionate and you know, did it intelligently, and it was the Presidio Trust, the, the people responsible for it, they had never had activism towards their plans before. And it was all, they were gonna cut a thousand trees because one tree had fallen, not even near a path. So the idea was that they cut a thousand trees that in a hundred years would then be a forest again. And we deal with these ideas 
within the bureaucracy quite often or within the corporate mindset that are just frankly ridiculous. And all it takes sometimes is one person to stand up and then suddenly people go, oh wait, there's some resistance to this. Let's take a second look. And in this case, four and a half days, a thousand. So if you're ever in the Presidio on one of the paths, you can thank Nadine <laughs> for, for saving that forest. Um, the other quick example I'll give that many of you may be aware of uh, on a much larger scale is the, the wonderful woman in Hawaii who the day after the election put out on her social media the idea for the Women's March. And millions of women and supporters later, you know, we had this massive expression. So it's a really powerful tool. The, the only cautionary note is to not succumb to what we call clicktivism. The idea that social media or being on your phone or on your computer is enough. It really only works when you take it offline in the case of the women's marches or in the case of her activism with the trees. It can't just live online. So it's powerful, but make sure that, that you use your body, your presence, uh, because that is our ultimate uh, most powerful tool. Yeah. Thank you, John. Molly. I was just going to say, you know, I think that uh, having sort of grown up as a digital native um, and working in an industry like media, which has been completely revolutionized by the advent of social media, it's a true double-edged sword. I mean, the most recent example, you know, like John was saying, the power of one person. Um, I have a good friend who just this week, um, he's a 27-year-old uh, French kid with one tweet, um, got Turkish Airlines to agree to six weeks of flights to Somalia to bring aid, with a second tweet raised over $1.5 million in, uh, I think, under 24 hours through 80,000 donors to actually buy the aid to bring it to Somalia. So again, sort of one person doing all of this work. Um, it really shows that. On the other hand, you know, it's what Riot, which started off as sort of an activist news organization, um, we were really just a blog. We were sitting in a garage in Mar Vista. This was five years ago. Um, my co-founders, Bryn and David and I, and we, um, on Twitter, look the same as CNN and as the New York Times, right? The feed, it just appears, there's a little logo, there's your name, and there's 140 characters. We were breaking news before the Huffington Post, and this was this incredible moment where we were like, oh my gosh, this democratization of storytelling and of distribution is allowing for a teeny little shop like Riot to, uh, to be on the same stage as the CNNs and as the New York Times. We don't need to own news vans and satellites to do it, we just need computers. By the same token, that's how fake news and this epidemic that we're in right now was created. So technology itself and social media itself is agnostic. It's not good, it's not evil. Um, but what it's produced is, a, you know, on the one hand, something that I'm extremely grateful for, my industry, um, my position in it. And on the other, it's created the situation that we're in um, where in many cases, because there is no distinction um, between the, the verified nude sources and those who aren't, uh, the present day situation. <laughs> Thank you for that. Ramsey, your thoughts? Well, first of all, thank I'm so honored to be here. With, and it's a, John and Molly are le you know, legendary, and it's just a, a, a privilege to be on the stage. I, I would say, uh, building on what both uh, Molly said, the power of one, in some ways, the one thing I've learned the most working with you know, Mark and uh, I was actually with Mark and Van in Flint, um, and it was a very powerful uh, experience for me because we were really in the community with the folks. It wasn't on camera. It was just Mark, Van, me, and a few other people meeting with residents of Flint. And what I saw from both of them and what Mark has shown me in all the years I've worked with them is they are we people, not me people. And, you know, with certain kinds of voices, certain kinds of personalities, certain kinds of uh, motivating people, they are we people. Mark is always, it's about we, not me. And when he talks and he inspires people, it's not I did this or I, I, this look at me. It's like, look at we, we are together. This is about us. I'm one of 
one of everybody. I'm, 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 I'm with you, whatever you are. I'm with you. And when we talk about the power of one and taking action and social media and Twitter and 140 characters and clicktivism, I think it's really this is the future of how we think about building the grassroots and taking back the world that we need to in order to survive. It's got to be about us together and learning what new technology is and how it works in a we world, not a me world, or an isolated world of, of individual technology. Because honestly, clicktivism makes you feel good, but it doesn't accomplish. I think we're going to talk about this later in the panel, you know, what is effective advocacy you know, is a, an email or a phone call or a visit. Yeah. You know, so that's where I'm at on this. And I do, I, mean, I think it's the we, and you see people who make you feel like Van, he inspires people to be a part of, because you're with him. He's not yeah. telling you what to do, you're joining him mm -hmm. together on an equal, you just, it's a big, it's a, it's, it's a subtle but important thing. Um, to me as we move forward. Now. Yeah, it, it's li like leading by example, right? Uh, you know, I'm doing this, how about you doing that? You know, follow what has worked for me. Which leads me to my next question, which is, um, uh, you know, there was a huge rise in phone calls. Uh, our representatives were saying, well, I got hundreds of thousands of phone calls. This is all happening after the election. The mobilization of so many people, I think, is palpable after, as you said, the, the women's march where we had our allies with men and children, too, and elders. Um, so, you know, in terms of organizing and, and, and actually taking action out, can you talk to us about, remember when we went down to City Hall a couple of weeks ago, to uh, buy back the farm because I don't know if you guys all know this, but uh, there used to be a, a beautiful farm downtown in LA and uh, John has been spearheading getting it back. You wanna talk about that? Sure, I, and again, I, I'm gonna reemphasize the importance of our presence, whether it's our physical presence or our voice because the, the power of a phone call to an elected official these days has grown exponentially because simply people don't do it the same way that they used to. So what, what um, Francis is referring to is the South Central Farm, which 10, 11 years ago was the largest urban farm in America. And we're waging this campaign, you'll see some photos later, to restore it. It's the last large open space in Los Angeles. And we've been going, it's, it's, a, it's a true long shot effort on one level, but 11 years later, they still haven't built a warehouse, so a lot of us feel like there's some larger power at play. So we've been trudging to City Hall and calling and doing all of this. Well, at the last hearing, which Francis came out to, all three city council people who spoke on the matter, in fact, one uh, from District 8, he, he referred to the Lorraine Motel in Memphis in terms of the historical nature of the South Central Farm, which was the birthplace of environmental justice in America, and certainly in Los Angeles, and some say in America. And he was referring to the Lorraine Motel, which later became the National Civil Rights Museum. The other two council members who spoke encouraged the current owner, Pima, to sell to the farmers. And we actually have pledges to buy the farm back now it's making the seller a willing seller. And so I believe that the calls to the city council, the, the direct contact led to a hearing which was completely dominated by a narrative that we would want, which is the best thing for the community is to restore the farm and to have Pima sell it back. And they clearly were not happy about that because they were in city hall as well. But the, our greatest gift, and I, and I was so moved by Van's speech, is our humanness and our commonality. We all have dreams, everyone has dreams, everyone wants their children to do well, and we forget that sometimes with this artificial distance of these electro screens in our electronic communications. And just remembering to listen 
and to be present with other people, whether it's an elected official who's used to being berated and you know pressured from all sides. It's, an, it's like a flower that's being watered. I, I saw it the other day when we were back at city council. So um, it's really important that we participate with our presence, our voice, and not just through our fingers. And, and there is a petition online that you guys can all sign, but I'm going to give you a little hint. Uh, just go to hashtag buy back the farm and uh, you can follow that trail and you'll get to the petition and sign it and pass it on. I want to pick up on something that you said about um, journalism and, and how, how Riot is equal in the Twitter universe to CNN. And so how do you think that uh, tech has affected journalism? Oh man, <clears throat> well, maybe I'll play. So I do have a video that I sent over. Um, I don't know if we're able to, to play that, um, but it shows a little bit of footage of what Riot's been doing and how we've been doing it and where we've been over the last couple of years. If we can cue it, awesome. If not, I'll just talk about it. That's my team that you saw up there. Um, you saw virtual reality cameras, you saw GoPros, you saw, you saw augmented reality happening on phones and on tablets. Um, and you know, we, because we were a little startup, three people in a garage to begin with, um, with no marketing budget, certainly, um, we had to figure out how to get what we thought was important out there into the world. Um, and the way that we sought to do that was making what's important interesting. And I think that that's something that, um, that, that technology enables in a, really, um, in a really profound way. So, you know, we started off as a blog. Um, we started doing documentary films, trying to see what worked. And we were gauging our success as an organization, not just on how many people were coming to our website and how many people were, were watching Riot Films, but also on how many people we were converting from passive reader or viewer into active participant. So every one of our stories and every one of our films had a call to action at the end, whether it was a donate to this related cause or sign this petition. We actually launched the day that Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast, so it was a really interesting moment to prove this model of news in action. And every story or piece of coverage that we had about Hurricane Sandy was linked to an organization working on the ground there. And um, the first time we did a virtual reality film, I'll, I'll take you on this little story because it's, it's relevant. Um, we, you know, we'd seen virtual reality cameras out there. This was in uh, early 2015, but they were all really expensive. They required tons of camera operators. Um, and, you know, we had, we didn't have any money and we didn't, we were working out in the field. We couldn't bring additional camera operators. But the first time that we wanted to do a VR film um, was actually a friend of ours named Matthew Cook, who many of you might know. He's an amazing director and prison reform advocate who built a solitary confinement cell in his backyard in Venice to put his friends in there and be like, isn't it crazy that in 2015 we're still locking people in boxes and think that's okay? Um, and he was doing it because inmates are a notoriously hard segment of the population to generate empathy for, because most of us will never see the inside of a jail cell, let alone the inside of a solitary confinement cell. So how can you expect, right? <laughs> so how can you expect someone to know what that's like um, when you haven't put them there physically or emotionally? So we put a VR camera in the middle of this little solitary confinement cell um, and it recorded what was basically just a rudimentary still image, um, a bed, a door, a toilet, bleak AF. And we um, had a guy do a voiceover recording who had been wrongfully convicted of murder 
put into prison, while he was in prison, killed someone in self-defense, and then was put into solitary for what was going to be, I think, a 20-year sentence that was shortened when he was exonerated by DNA evidence after seven years in solitary. So he's walking you through his experience, and we premiered this short at Tribeca Film Festival in 2015. It was the first time they had VR in their interactive portion, and we paired it with um, this ACLU petition to ban youth solitary confinement which there were no laws against until Obama issued an executive action um, in part due to this ACLU petition. But what we saw was every single person who watched that at Tribeca took off the headset and signed the petition. And even though this wasn't at scale, it was us literally physically putting headsets on people's faces and then handing them a petition afterwards, we'd just never seen a conversion rate like that before with any medium on any platform. So that was a moment where we were like, oh, we should maybe be doing more of this virtual reality filmmaking thing. 24 hours after the Tribeca Award Ceremony, and it was at Tribeca where we first saw that GoPro-based VR rig, 24 hours after that, the Nepal earthquake hit. The Nepal earthquake hit. Um, Kathmandu was devastated, there was an avalanche on um, Everest, and our co-founder David was going out there anyway as a first responder, and we were like, you gotta bring a VR camera with you. And so he does and comes back with the first immersive footage of a disaster zone ever. And it was just sort of accidental that we got it. He set up the rig while he was building um, houses, while he was digging out rubble, while he was in the food lines. And we put it into this little film, Susan Sarandon, who's a friend and very involved in Nepal, did a voiceover for it. And all of a sudden the media was like, holy shit, there's a use case for VR that's not porn and games. And we got tremendous amounts of press on it. The New York Times picked it up, BBC picked it up. Every person who we put the headset on and showed it to them would take it off either in tears or asking where they could give money. And we were like, oh my God, we have to call every single nonprofit we know and that we've been linking our stories to because this is the fundraising tool that they've been waiting for. They can't take every one of their donors on a giving trip, but they can put them all in a headset at their fall galas. So we called all of them and they all were like, yeah, we want one of these and we have no money to pay for it. And we were like, okay, <laughs> we'll do it anyway because it needed to happen. And so by accident, through that, we built up basically the largest production shop for this kind of VR filmmaking in the country. And then as soon as Facebook 360 launched and YouTube 360 launched, all of the news outlets that were being approached by those platforms to make 360 content for them had no idea how or interest in building up that in-house, so they were coming to us. So we worked with the New York Times and NPR and the Huffington Post and the Associated Press to do their first VR films with them. And that's what got us to where we are today. You know, we went out to raise a Series A round and Huffington Post bought us instead. Um, but it wouldn't have been uh, if it wasn't for this virtual reality piece. And what we found was uh, a way of making what was important interesting by putting it in a new medium. And not just a gimmicky medium, one that truly communicates on a deep level um, stuff that we've been reading headlines about for years, for instance. Uh, we, took, we, got, we got the first VR footage out of Aleppo, Syria, and I'd been writing the headlines myself in a garage about the Syrian refugee crisis for three years and didn't actually understand the scope and scale of it until I put on a VR headset and looked around the streets of Aleppo. And it was like this moment, and you know, there's, it was, we talk about it, like there's two types of people when it comes to VR. There's people who believe in the power of it, and there's people who haven't tried it. <laughs> so I encourage any of you who haven't yet, come to the Riot office, you know, in Mar Vista, or find a friend who has one, and we'll show you this. So for us, if, 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 you, if it follows that people have been trying to get closer to the story for years, hundreds of years, from like the town crier to, you know, radio and you're in your living room to TV and you're watching it 24 hours a day and it's in your pocket all the time, actually being transported there in a virtual setting is the next best thing to, to hopping on a plane and to creating a sense of presence. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Um, you Sorry, just uh, so answered my fourth question, <laughs> like uh, specific examples, you know, because uh, trying to get the news out, at, like for Standing Rock, uh, where Debbie and I were there, John, you were there. We How many time. people went to Standing Rock? <laughs> okay, here we are. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, no, nothing hit the mainstream media until Shailene Woodley got arrested, which I think is probably a positive thing. But, uh, you know, I, I realize that there is hardly, what is that, 20 minutes left? I want to ask you, Ramsey, maybe we'll circle back around 
to uh, the lack of news coverage from the mainstream media, except for Riot and the Young Turks and uh, Unicorn Riot and the indigenous uh, media, starting with digital smoke signals, if anybody is aware of uh, what the was going name. on there. Um, it was disheartening, actually, to not see uh, the mainstream media take what was happening at Standing Rock seriously. Anyway, let me move on and ask you, you have Mark as your spokesperson to get the message out. Do you find having one person to be the communicator for an issue is um, a good thing? Or do you think that, because I want other people to know uh, what they can do when they have to get a message out. Because here at, at the Environmental Media Association, we have the numerous um, actors and musicians who are activists who could represent. What are your thoughts on this? I anticipated this question, so I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I still I don't know. I did a Donna Brazil on him. I, 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 she did. I still don't know how to answer it because on the one hand, having um, a spokesperson for a cause, so in, my, in, my, in this instance, it's, it's water. Uh, after uh, the fracking fight in New York, which is how Mark and I first joined up, we fought fracking together and got the first ban. Well, actually, this, Vermont was first, but the first real statewide ban on fracking in New York. And it was really, I think, probably the most important environmental victory that we've seen in a long time. And I'm really glad to have been a part of that. And Mark played a really important role, as did Deborah Winger and some other celebrities. I mean, and Josh Fox's movie, who we all know, Gasland, and, and Josh's use of celebrity and creating his own celebrity, I think is a fascinating. We could spend all day talking about Josh's ability to use new media. You know, I, I'll, here, I'll, I'll confess, Deborah Winger, showed me footage of this young kid's video, shaky video uh, of interviewing people in, in, in frack country across this. It was just, she invited me over, sat me down and showed me some stuff. And I watched it and I was like, meh, you know, whatever. Some kid with his video, you know, that was, ga that was gas land. She also showed it to oh Robert Redford. <laughs> and he said, As, this is good. I think we should do something with this. So, I, you know, that just goes to show you what I know. Nothing. I, saw it and I had no idea what I was looking at. And it, it was gas land. And Deborah was the executive producer of gas land. And, you know, so you probably, I should probably sit down and somebody else can come up here. And just sit. But um, <clears throat> as far as, you know, when you talk about, anyone talks about a celebrity, what I've learned the hard way is it's not easy to be a celebrity. And every advisor in Hollywood, every agent, every PR person, and now I deal with them all all the time, their advice is, you know, sit down and shut up. You know, your brand your is, is, is about making movies and the best thing you can do is not do this. And every time as a PR person or as an agent, I have to talk to Ramsey Adams, that's a bad day. Oh. You know, and so it's the celebrity has to really, you know, in Mark's case or anybody's case, they, they are really going out on a limb and mm -hmm. defying all the good advice of the people who know how to protect a brand to do something like going to Standing Rock, going to Flint, working on water, talking about Bernie Sanders, it doesn't matter. It is a risk to the brand. It's, it's, it's hard to predict what the impact will be, what, you know, if you're the Hulk and you're a liberal environmental activist, you know, what does that mean? And so it's a risk. And so, you know, the, the, the key is to, in my instance, and, uh, you know, I think people that I work with, who work with celebrities, is to really understand that they're just people, they're really sweet, smart people trying to do the right thing and they're taking a risk and you know, working with them as people and not like, what can I get out of this person? You know, for the cause, it's always for the right reasons, but to sort of step back and say, you know, like in the long term, what's, 
how do we protect and get the most out of uh, what they're offering and be generous of spirit. And to answer your question specifically, that's why I think it's better in numbers ah. than alone. Because it's, it's lonely when you're alone. To be and when you're with, I mean, I, I see the relief come over my friends' faces when they're standing with some of their colleagues, like at the, uh, the march and uh, the, the protest in, in New York City the day before the inauguration. And it was, you know, yes. uh, uh, Alec Baldwin and Cher and Mark and, you know, and a whole host of people. But together it was like the sigh of, it wasn't just Mark. Yes, yes, and you're not so much of a target, and you're with your allies, and um, I, I find it interesting that some people uh, seem to think that because someone is in the public eye that they don't have a right to voice their opinion when we're all citizens like everybody else, and some people are just trying to use the platform that they have, like Mark has a huge following, and he gets the message out. I mean, I learned about Standing Rock from Shailene Woodley's Twitter feed and Josh Fox. Uh, I would not have known about it because, as I said, it was not in the mainstream media, but I followed those two friends and, wow, what is this? It's amazing. And, uh, you know, speaking of Twitter, I love Twitter so much. Uh, I learned so much. You know, you can just follow a hashtag and go down that rabbit hole and uh, learn all kinds of things. and. Uh, and, and pictures, tell a thousand words, is that the thing, yeah? Uh, what do you think about in terms of like uh, the impact of a meme or a visual in terms of telling the story? Don't you have some things you wanna show us? I do, I do, and I think it's a good segue from what he was just talking about, uh, about uniting because the only way that we make this work is if we unite. And part of the way in our visual culture now, let's go ahead and, and bring this up. Uh, the, historically, there has been, um, before I go to this first slide, photography in the last 100 years has played a crucial role environmentally in terms of helping to protect the Grand Canyon. Ansel Adams photography in the West was, was a major player in a lot of conservation efforts. We've seen uh, historically photojournalism, a singular image, the, the person standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square and famous photographs, catalyzed change. I've been working in a medium which is essential, essentially about making group activism a celebrity unto itself and communicating the power uh, through United Action. So I'm gonna take you on a quick tour of three places, three images, and the impact that they had. This was an image that we did in Paris during the climate talks. It happened a few weeks after the bombing, the, the terrorist bombings there, where every public event was canceled. The big climate march was canceled. We persevered like a a dog with a bone, you know, like we just said it will happen. And this was the first publicly permitted event after the bombings. And there were two things that happened with this image. One is that the original concept for the event was a thousand people on the lawns by the Eiffel Tower celebrating women's leadership on climate. And, uh, after the bombings, when I saw on Facebook that Eiffel Tower peace sign image, I just said, this has to be the image. But the whole, all of our sponsors, all the groups, the organizations that were supporting us, it was all about a message about 100% renewable energy. So when it came down to doing it, I said, this has to be the image. And there was a lot of pushback, like, well, these two don't go together. You know, it's a, that's an energy message, that's a peace message. And I was like, well, wait, what, what? How is it that we've gotten so siloed in our thinking that we don't think peace and environment connect together? I mean, one of our supporters was Greenpeace and they were one of the ones saying, wait, these don't, and, and, and I said, that's, just look at your name. And 
I said, it, and ultimately I just said, look, as an artist, I'm going to put this out into the world and see what they do with it. Because it may not make sense in this moment, but I think intrinsically maybe it will. And the aspect of how peace relates to environment, when your massive climate march is canceled because people are afraid for their safety, then the connection starts to become clear. So what happened with this was much different than had been envisioned, is it went viral, it was on front pages around the world, the New York Times ran it big. These are just a few examples, and I talked earlier about making group ac activism a celebrity. Well, we also wanted to make it, oh, shoot, how do I go back on this? A rock star. Hey, so this was my personal favorite. We were right there with Jimmy, and you know some of these other folks on the Rolling Stone Twitter feed or their Instagram feed, excuse me. So these kinds of actions are really powerful for marking a moment. The other aspect to this is the climate agreement didn't call for 100% renewable energy. But this photograph, more than any other single photograph, has become the iconic shot from the Paris Climate Talks. So every time they do a story about the Paris Climate Talks, there's this repetition of 100% renewable. That's our goal, and that was part of the strategy. So there's a lot of layers to this. We, and thank you, Francis, she was with us at Standing Rock, did incredible work there. And one of the things about Standing Rock is a lot of the images that were coming out of Standing Rock were violent images, you know, people being arrested, dragged off, dogs, tear gas. There was a need to, to make a, a, a contribution into the visual sort of tableau of Standing Rock of something positive. This is an image that we did with the youth council there where we created a human medicine wheel. It says, protect, water is life. This, the indigenous rising media took this, did some incredible viral videos of it, which we won't see right now, but you can go online to indigenous rising media. And this, you know, Van really, really struck me because I think he is right on and I'm hoping he runs in 2020. Um, yeah. Van for Second president. Let's encourage him for that. You heard but it here first. One of the people who helped us on this is a farmer named Art Tanderup, whose farm, whose family farm is literally on the Keystone Pipeline route. And I worked with him to help, and Asher Levin, he came out, and we did a, the world's largest crop art on his farm, and later did a concert with Willie Nelson and Neil Young on his farm, and won the initial victory on Keystone. But the lesson of the Keystone fight is so crucial for all of us moving forward. Conservative, Christian, Republican, red state farmers and ranchers working shoulder to shoulder with Occupy style Native Americans from South Dakota. All because there is something that unites us that is greater than this perception of the political duality. And that is the building blocks of life, water, land, food, family. That is what gives me great hope. And I feel that same hope when we look at the South Central Farm, which I discussed earlier. And yeah, all right, all right, right on. Well, this is the story of how one image, um, this is the farm 11 years ago, largest urban farm in America. There was, it, it was incredible. You could walk across the street on a 100 de degree day, uh, you know, walk 100 yards into the farm, it's 85 degrees. This place was a lush, and, and so what happened is, I won't go into the long story, but essentially the farmers were evicted in 2006. It had existed for 14 years. It grew out of the aftermath of the 1992 riots. We staged a, uh, an encampment there. You can see uh, EMA board member Daryl Hanna and I, we lived in this tree for 23 days uh, until they eventually came, came and uh, grabbed us in a fire truck and dragged us away. Um, and you can see the police presence there. It was a really traumatic day for Los Angeles. The city leadership 
let the people of Los Angeles down. The mayor, Via Ragosa at the time, reneged on his pledge, his campaign pledge to save the farm. They bulldozed the farm. Annenberg Foundation pulled a bunch of the trees uh, and moved them over to Huntington Gardens. So 10 years later, after we all kind of had thought, okay, it's dead, it's gone. On the 10 year anniversary, we, would, we did this artistic action with the farmers where we snuck in and the night before hand measured this 14 acres and the next day did a procession with these giant letters that spelled out Akia Stamos with a giant carrot that said, we're still here. And what happened from that is that a whole new movement to get the land back uh, there's a woman named Annie Thornton from the Flora Thornton Foundation who saw this image and said, whoa, we've got to do something with this. So what happened is the carrot, it's a, the pin I have on, it's all about the power of the carrot. They helped us launch a new campaign for the digital era with Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all of this, and did created all of these materials and we, at the EMA Awards in October, you see Shailene holding up the Bring Back the Farm. And Daryl, this is at city council going to testify. So I guess the point of this is that that one action, that one visual that said Ikea Stamos has led to a whole campaign and a real possibility of getting this farm back. It, it's LA's standing rock. The people, the farmers, they are people who can grow food out of concrete. I mean, they are amazing, amazing humans who understand the connection to land, earth, food. And just yesterday, this image that we took six months ago is now on a billboard overlooking downtown LA and more are coming. So images, as you saw in these three, I know I took a little bit of time here, but they can grow into other things. And we hope any of you here who wanna to talk to me about how you can help with the South Central Farm, please uh, come up to me and we're at a crucial moment and we still have a chance to get it back. Thank you. Thank you, John. How much time? Oh my goodness, we've only got three minutes left. I was going to take some questions from the audience, but I feel as if I want to give you guys the 30 seconds to communicate anything you want to first, just like the earlier panel. So, Ramsey, what would you like to tell people about social, whatever? Ye yesterday was uh, World Water Day. Um, yeah. Berta Kateris was murdered a year ago in Honduras. Uh, she was an, uh, an indigenous activist who um, I met because she re received the Goldman Environmental Prize last uh, Two year, a year and a half ago, two years ago, and I, I, I got to spend some real quality time listening to her stories about what it's like to be an, uh, an activist in a place like Honduras. And she said to me, um, I wasn't alone, but th that she was willing to risk her life and to be a celebrity, which she became an activist celebrity and willing to risk her life. This is a mother with young children. And she looked me in the eye and said, I'm willing to risk my life. I didn't understand the levity of what she was saying to me at the time, of course. Sure enough, they kill her. Just, it was the, 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 the hydroelectric company officials and government Four people have been indicted in the murder of her, two government people, two hydroelectric officials. They just murdered her. They murdered her. Um, so yesterday, Mark, well, actually, the day before yesterday, Mark, you know, texted me and said, you know, Berta. Mm -hmm. So we just put out a really, you know, basic never forget tweet on our water defense, you know, and Mark, shared it and his friend shared it. What was interesting is it crashed every website that we have. Water defense was down. You know, we had to go and you know, buy new data storage because we just got, it, you know, because we had put, <laughs> the tweet went to this little blog post on water defense and it just wiped it out. We'd never gotten that much kind of traffic. And 
I don't know what I learn. I haven't processing it, what that all means, but I just, Berta and yeah. Yeah. social media and there are celebrity activists too and that's a, also can be very dangerous thing to do. So I don't, I don't really know what I'm saying, but I, again, I just want to. <laughs> you know, yes, we all honor Berta for actually sacrificing her life for the cause of water around the world. Molly. So I've been trying to figure out how to say this. Um, when I came back from Standing Rock, I mean, that was an incredible thing to see. Um, I went with um, our good friend Nikki and we stayed with Shailene and it was this amazing experience and we were out there really, really cold and it was only for, you know, part of a day. And coming back, I was thinking about the people that had been there for months and months and months and months and realized that this is something common that I've seen sort of throughout my years working in disaster response and um, in sort of the nonprofit, for-profit intersection is this idea that purpose is a basic human necessity. And that what you can withstand when you have purpose is, you know, complete degradation of your human rights, um, you know, not having enough food, not having heat, not having water. Like, you can withstand so much more when you have that purpose. You see that throughout history. And this might be a little bit radical to say, but like, you, none of you guys have to feel bad if you don't care about any of the things that we're talking about. If you don't care about Standing Rock and that's not your issue, that's okay. If you don't care about water, that's okay, it's not your issue. But find something that you do care about because as Lance Bass was saying um, and you know, as Mark Ruffalo was saying, like probably Mark Ruffalo has been approached by dozens and dozens of organizations throughout the course of his celebrity and it wasn't a fit for him, right? And we might think that having a celebrity on board is gonna be categorically a great thing. It's not if they're not authentically invested in the outcome of this cause. Um, but someone is going to be, right? And maybe that's you. And go towards what breaks your heart. Um, and maybe you find it there. So, um, that, I think, is what it is, is find your perfect purpose because you will be able to withstand so much yes. more. With passion, you can uh, implement your purpose and affect better things in the world. John? Uh, We're about gonna, out of time, but I'll give uh, you the uh, last I'll word. Just, I'll be brief. I'll make it quick. Um, risk your body. Everyone in here is incredibly privileged. Everyone in here is a leader. We need you to step up. And for your own soul, I encourage you to put your body on the line. Get out, get out there. And if, you know, we used to do trainings 20 years ago, frontline direct action trainings. Our press releases were, uh, the headline was how to get arrested. And, uh, uh, you know, for many of you that might be a step too far, but go to Standing Rock. I know when Debbie Levin, I mean, I witnessed Debbie and Francis at the front edge of an action that could have resulted in arrest. And it was incredibly moving to see people who were so far outside their comfort zone, who were compelled to stand for life. Water is life, land is life, family is life, food is life. We're at that point. Everything is under assault. And we need you to use your money, your talent, your communication power, and your body, your physical presence, it is incredibly powerful when you make that kind of stand. Commit to that. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, just, just to pounce on that, you know, the Women's March again, right? That was a vastly well-organized thing of over three million people in the United States alone. But look at what happened without any social media at all when the Muslim ban happened. People got their butts down to the, to the, to the uh, airports and they were there for days, right? It was like telepathic. It didn't go out that much at the beginning because it happened so fast. So once you're activated, stay activated and stay in touch. And, telepathically too, through your hearts. Thank you.
Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Thank you.